Um, why don't we start with introductions, Alex? Um, tell us who you brought with you so people know their, their so, reference uh, points. Yeah, I'm obviously Alex Porter. I'm the head coach at the University of Essex in England. Uh, and also on the call today, we have Logan Zotovich, who was our men's setter last year, uh, as well as P, who was our, our women's setter last year. Um, Logan was at uh, UC Irvine, and P was at University of Denver. Good night. So why don't we just do this? Uh, Alex, why don't you talk about the structure of uni volleyball in the UK, how it ties in with the NVL and, and all that stuff to give people a framework of, of what's going on over there. Okay. So uh, in Europe, uh, nearly every single country, uh, the main focus is club orientated. Universities aren't a, uh, a big um, entity within the volleyball world. But obviously there's always exceptions to that uh, whereas in the US everything is is focused around NCAA and IIA and then uh, after that is is a, a club structure where as in in England or in Britain um, we're kind of like this hybrid between the two of them so we have uh, Bucks which is uh, the British University's college sports um, which is the equivalent of like, the NCAA but we also have a, a national league as well and so our athletes will compete in both Bucks and in the, the National League. Um, quite a few universities compete um, in, in both uh, competition structures, but they're completely separate. They have slightly different rules. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and some universities will be in a lower division in the National League and are working their way up towards the top Super League. Um, as for the the, the level, um, it's probably easier to ask P or, or Logan in the comparison, but obviously it's nowhere near what the NCAA standard is. Um, but we do have uh, quite a few Americans uh, in our national league and within the, the buck structure as well, um, which means that they help increase the standard of volleyball in our country. But Logan, what do you think uh, of the standard in comparison to the states on the men's side? Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's completely different. Like you said, um, I think that, you know, they half of the, half of the field is, is pretty strong, you know, in the South, it was Bournemouth, UEL and us in the North, it was Northumbria, Durham and, uh, what was the other one? Yeah, Nottingham. Those league, were like yeah. the, those were like Sheffield. the stronger teams. Yeah, so we, we played, you know, we half of the season was really, really competitive, I think, and I think the other half, you know, w weren't walking the parks, but were less challenging. But, I I mean, it, it is a step down from the NCAA, but I don't think it's, I think you can find it to be really competitive at least for half or more of the season, definitely. And what about you, Pete? Yeah, I'd agree with the, the same thing, especially for... Um, Super 8s, I guess, whenever it's like the top eight teams, that is the second half of your club season, and that's when things start to get really competitive. And so it's almost like every week you're looking to play a pretty good team. So a good amount of competition. Again, not exactly up to par with NCAA, but you're still competing against people who have played in the NCAA before as well as people from all across the world, which is even more fun, I think, is whenever you're competing against a team and you can't even understand what language they're speaking. <laughs> just like, whoa, this is cool. Like, it's definitely different than what you're getting in the States. So, yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, Alex, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is interestingly choppy. Um, can you, one of the features of, of volleyball over there, of sport over there, as it is across Europe, is promotion and relegation and, and a structure based on the capability of teams moving up and down. So you guys and most of the performance programs at this point, if not all of them, actually, why don't we start by describing what a performance program is and then we'll, we'll carry on with what I was just going to ask. Okay. So um, if you go back 10 years ago, there was only one performance program, which is where uh, 
the university invests in a coach and scholarships and the athletes will train on a daily basis or almost a, a daily basis uh, with some support for the athletes um, in lifestyle, maybe S&C, uh, and some workshops throughout the year on sports psych, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that would be a, a, a basis of what a, a program is. Uh, and obviously there's a, a varying degree of what programs uh, offer. Uh, so at the very top, just as I described, uh, and then there's programs lower down, which may only train twice a week. You might only have one or two players on a scholarship and the rest are normal uh, students. Um, other, some teams are made up of uh, almost 100% uh, British students. Others are made up of 100% uh, American or Canadian or Brazilian postgrads. Others have a, a mixture between, uh, between those two. So um, we don't have the, the same rules like in the NCAA where to be a D1 program, you must offer A, B, C, D, E. It's up to the individual universities um, and they can offer that funding and they can also stop that funding um, whenever they kind of want. Um, but the, the way that our leagues are structured is that um, they're based on merit. So in the Bucks League, you have uh, the, the uh, Premier League, uh, which is split in a North and South conference with six teams in each. So you play each other twice uh, and then you go to the playoffs or the bracket uh, where the the North plays against uh, the South. Um, and then the final was held um, for every single sport in one location on one day. So you have the volleyball final, basketball, netball, rugby, tennis, cricket, every single sport. And that's called Bucks Big Wednesday. Um, so that's the, the pinnacle uh, of the buck season. Um, and you mentioned about like relegation and, and promotion. So in, in bucks, the way it works is that the team who is bottom of the, the Premier League will play off against teams from Division One. Um, and I can never remember which way around it is, but I think there's five conferences in Division One. So that they work it out. It's like a triangular. Um, for, and the winners of that, they go up to the, the Premier League the year after uh, and the, the losers go down to or stay in Division 1. And it's the same between Division 1 and Division 2 and Division 2 and Division 3, but the, the number of conferences gets bigger as you go down the tree. Uh, so Division 3 is very much regionalised, um, whereas Division 2, uh, I think there's six conferences, so three in the south, three in the, the central, three in the north. So there's a, but those, and those conferences slightly change in their structure every single year. So it's uh, very much based on merits. You, you cannot uh, buy your way into the, the Premier League. Um, it doesn't matter how um, the university approaches it. We started in Division 2 at Essex when I joined, um, and then we went on a two-year unbeaten streak because we had a program and we were playing against normal students who probably trained once a week. Um, in those lower divisions uh, and then we got up to the Premier League which uh, then we start facing other programs uh, who were, were challenging us and then the, the flip side of that is the club structure in the National League uh, the top division is called the Super League uh, which uh, this year there's 10 teams in the Super League uh, and they play everyone once and then the top five breakaway and the bottom five breakaway where they play each other twice so they get more competitive games and what normally happens, and obviously with coronavirus, this has uh, interrupted uh, our season, but what normally happens, there'll be a, a playoff, again, between the bottom team and the Super League. Uh, sorry, the Super League bottom team would go directly down and Division 1 would go directly up. And then the ninth place would play the second place in a playoff. Um, and so, again, same as Bucks, that kind of structure goes down. So there's one Super League, uh, one Division 1, but there's two Division 2s and then three or four Division threes, and they all have these playoffs to, to go up or down each season. So, for example, uh, it was Durham a few years ago when they started in the National League. They started in Division three, uh, and they had a team that probably could have won the Super League, but because it's based on merit, you've got to win Division three, win Division two, win Division one, and then get up to the Premier League or Super League. Although there's also the Cup. So a team mm -hmm. like that could actually end up winning the cup, but still be way down in the in the league. Yeah, yeah. So in in the national league setup and the club structure, uh, we have the the national cup, 
which you have national league teams as well as non-league uh, teams enter it. So you could be a little village team and enter it with some, some ringers uh, and then find yourself playing in a, a semi-final or a final, which uh, happened to my team about 10 years ago. Um, yeah, and that, that has happened, uh, for example, with Durham uh, and with Northumbria. They, they uh, were lower in the National League or, in fact, with with Northumbria this year, they, were, they weren't in the National League uh, and they managed to get to uh, a National Cup semi-final. Like the finals were unfortunately cancelled, so we never got to see who won that. But yeah, the National Cup, anyone can enter that structure as well. Um, when I was coaching in England, uh, I coached at Exeter, which was at that time in Division One. Well, actually, my first year we had men and women in Division One. Second year we also added teams in Division Two. This is in box. Um, Division One, it was just we were in the West League, so and it was six teams, round robin, double round robin format. Uh, so you played ten matches in the league. And then you would go on to, if you qualify for championship, you would go on. And in and, and those days, they had final eights. So you could earn your way into final eights. They, they, they've gone bracket now, which I think is disappointing. But yeah, it is what it is. Um, at that time, if you were bottom half of your Division One league, you went into, into the, the Bucks Cup structure, which was a knockout tournament. Uh, below that, Division Two, and I don't know if this applies across both Division Two and Division Three, if that exists in that particular league. But there's there's a separate cup for those teams, and it's that's an, a season long competition. So they'll start yeah, that's correct. So in Division season. One, you have the national uh, trophy within Bucks. So mm -hmm. again, every single um, Division One conference will play in that competition. The final of that is actually held on Bucks Big Wednesday as well. Uh, right. Normally in the morning, so you get four uh, finals, two men, two, two women's finals, the, the trophy and the championship. Uh, and then below that in Division 2 and 3, you have the Conference Cup. So, uh, again, when we were in Division 2, there was three conferences in the south of England, uh, and so the teams played uh, across the three conferences, uh, and we won the, the South uh, Conference Cup. And there was the same thing in the, in the Midlands and, the, and another competition in the north. So depending on what level you're at, there's uh, multiple competitions that you can play in um, within one season. <coughs> yeah, and now to, to clarify for American viewers, I think Canadians are actually have a similar schedule to what you guys do in the UK. But in the US, you've, bas you've got a, a basically a one-semester season, regular season. For the women... It starts in September or, or late August and goes into December. First semester's over, season's over. Men start second semester and go basically to the end of that. In England, in the UK, it's the, pretty much the whole academic year. You take a break during the holiday break between terms. Other than that, you're, you're going until you're done, until you're knocked out of whatever competition you're in. Also, you can theoretically field as many teams as you can in Bucks. It's not like in, in the U.S. structure where you have one team. Maybe at certain levels in certain conferences, you might have a junior varsity team. But that, you know, which is kind of, oftentimes is a separate training squad. Um, like I mentioned before, my second year, we added teams in Division Two, And basically that was so we could split the first team up to get the bottom half of the roster more playing time. You could have as many teams as you've got, you know, players to fill and just have to manage within the guidelines. The, the, the rules are – there are rules on what day, um, you know, and, and in what competition. But I've, I thought it was a great developmental thing personally because I could take players who would not be getting time with the first team and give them matches, competitive matches in another competition. So they can they could enjoy it and have fun, um, and then so talk about what the schedule is like, Bucks versus National League because it's basically it's an overlapping it's a pair of overlapping seasons. Yeah, so the way um, every university will start at a slightly different time, uh, but 
generally in September or the first week of October. At Essex, we're one of the last universities to start, uh, which for non-performance sports, that's always interesting because uh, sometimes they haven't had a chance to have trials before they have their first game. Uh, and that's very much a case for our, our second teams. So um, we have our welcome week, the last week of September. Uh, and then the week after that is when our second team hosts their, their trials on the Tuesday night. And then Wednesday is their first game. So the Buck season is, um, as you said, is made up of a, a league uh, and then a, a playoff, a, a bracket. Um, and we have 10 fixtures, but you have 14 weeks to be able to play those 10 fixtures for, for Essex because we start late. Other universities will have uh, maybe 15 or, or 16 weeks. Um, but over the summer months, the universities rearrange their fixtures to try and make it easier for themselves and, and each other. So... Um, uh, again, in Essex, we had uh, last year, I think, four of the six teams uh, in the, the Bucks Premier League. Uh, they had men's and women's. So we would go to UEL and would take both our men and women. And likewise, when they came to us, they'd bring both uh, their teams at the same time. Uh, all the, the Bucks League games have to be done by the first week in February. And then everyone has a week off. Uh, and then the, the bracket starts. Um, if you finish first or second in your conference, you get a bye straight through to the quarterfinals, so you don't have to play that first game. Um, and then each round of the bracket is two weeks apart. Uh, if you lose uh, in the bracket, that's it. You're, you're done. So in theory, you could be done by the middle of February if you lost in the first round. Uh, if our final this year would have been on uh, March the 26th. Uh, which bizarrely is actually in our first week of our holidays. For other university, it will be their last week of their academic term. Uh, again, it's just the way the, the calendar works. Um, so for Bucks, we start our pre-season uh, around the middle of September, like the 15th, 16th of September, and we'll go the whole way through until Easter, pretty much. Uh, and then how does that compare to the National League? Uh, Clubs can schedule games for early September, but the reality is, is everyone pushes their uh, their fixtures back until probably the third or the fourth week of September because they uh, need to train more so they can have a, a longer pre-season. So what we do with our partner clubs is we move all of our National League fixtures back until around the, the second weekend in October. Uh, and then we'll play our first nine games up until Christmas. Um, and then after that, uh, after the Christmas break, we have the uh, the second half uh, where it breaks away into the top five and the bottom five. Uh, and those games, I can't remember the exact date, but it's, it's something like the first week of May, those games have to be completed by. But again, if you're competing against other universities, they, they don't want to be playing their games during the, the Easter break. So again, everyone tries to help each other out and move those fixtures around. And so what you'll end up doing is, for example, let's say we're travelling from Essex and we're going up to play Durham and, say, Northumbria, who are only 40 minutes apart. We will play one of those on the Saturday and one of those on the Sunday, then travel back. Um, and when they come down south, they will do the same. They'll play against us and another, another team in London just to try and reduce on, on travel and to try and get those, those fixtures in. But they... So the Bucks and the National League both run concurrently, which means it's a very long season. And every year, part of the recruitment process, I point this out. Um, and like, yeah, 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 it's fine, it's fine. And then we get to Christmas and everyone's like, like I'm, I'm gassed. And I'm like, yep, and we're only 50% of the way through. <laughs> so uh, it's nice for the, the postgrads uh, to have three weeks off over Christmas and then come back. Um, and most of the time they're, they're nice and refreshed, had some family time, for some of them a bit of sun, because it gets a little bit dark over here. Um, uh, yeah, and then we, we hit the ground running again and hopefully go through to the, the Bucks finals and uh, potentially in the, the top half of the Super League. Uh, and just real quick, uh, your Bucks schedules are, are almost exclusively on Wednesdays. And the National League stuff is, is always on the weekends. Correct, correct. So for, for Bucks, uh, the rules are that, uh, well, it's not necessarily a rule, but it's what happens, 
is that, um, that every, every single Wednesday is a Bucks um, fixture and we will leave in the morning and return in the evening. Uh, at Essex, we put all of our volleyball games on in the evening uh, because we want to make a showcase of it uh, and try and get a bit of a crowd in uh, with an announcer and a DJ, et cetera, et cetera. But when, for example, we went and played against Exeter, uh, Logan, do you remember what time you left last year? It was about 5 a.m. or something, 6 a.m.? Yeah, it was it was some some pretty early. So, yeah. and uh, but then we we travel, uh, play the game, turn around, come back, and then get back at you know ten o'clock at night, eleven o'clock at night. So, in my six years at Essex, we have only ever stayed over twice, uh, and that was because we played a team that was a long way away at eleven o'clock in the morning, which was very helpful. But it is what it is. So you just get on with it. Yeah, and then as you said, National League is always on a weekend. So, so P and Logan, can you just describe the different difference in the experience as uh, as an athlete, as a student athlete, between what you know what you've gotten used to playing in college and then coming and now having to play this whole season with funky, funky schedules and and no cushions in travel and <laughs> no overnight stays and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's just a lot of you having to be disciplined on your own. Um, obviously in the States, um, they put a lot of priority on sports and that's where a lot of money from schools go to. So we're able to have trainers that are taking care of our bodies and reminding us to do things um, and kind of checking in with us. But in England, you just have to do all that on your own. Um, a lot of us, older kids, I guess all the post-grads came in with like prior injuries or we just kind of knew what our bodies needed to be taken care of. And so it was just a lot of, you know, doing that on your own. Um, School-wise, I think just in comparison, um, in the NCAA, you are constantly having to do something. Like you're constantly like, oh, I have a lift. I have to go to class. I have to come back and then we have to train before actual training and like do all these extra things where a lot of your time was was put into volleyball as opposed to in school and at Essex there's just a lot more balance I think between you know having to have time to yourself to actually get things done with school but then also enjoy you know being in another country which I think me and Logan definitely took advantage of being able to travel because you can get anywhere from London so um, we definitely took advantage of that aspect as well which you can't really do in NCA. your time is just completely taken so yeah <laughs> my input yeah i mean i i i agree completely with p and then my own personal opinion as well as i mean with ncaa sports in america you're you're do, you're pushing the rule is 20 hour weeks but realistically it's a lot more than 20 hours a week um, and it's definitely, it's a, I think it's a much bigger commitment in the United States at a D one program. And I think the school kind of, um, builds up around you to help support you with that big commitment. And I think England, like P said, is kind of, you gotta, like they have things in place. Like we had a, we had a trainer, we had, um, you know, like a nutritionist and stuff like that, but they weren't like, like in, in, America, it'd be mandatory you had to go do that. In England, it was on your own time. Like, you find time to go see them. You had to have, you, have to, you had to talk to a uh, coach to, you know, set up a time with them and stuff like that. Um, I, I would say England has, you know, I got a job and I'm working now, so um, that's my new adventure. But, you know, my, my company talks a lot about having a work-life balance. And I think uh, in England, you have a better school volleyball life balance um you know you're practicing two to three times a week you're doing uh morning training sessions if you want you're lifting you know i I, and alex if this has changed sorry but you're lifting twice as a team two other times at least on your own um and then on top of that you have school that you have to take care of so you know there's a lot more time for yourself in England, which is nice. I, I, I know P kind of did the same thing. I got a part-time job on Thursday mornings working in a little farmer's market on campus. Like I think England gives a great opportunity for athletes who 
aren't done playing but don't have the amount of energy or the time or the <laughs> I didn't hear the last half of what you said, but I'm sure it was Dang. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, Did I cut out? What? Yeah, once once you got to uh something about the body. Dang. Um uh, then well, I, I kind of, we lost it. All right, well cut me off next time. I, I my <laughs> wife I must suck. I was saying if for me my I had a knee surgery in college and stuff, so my body couldn't put up with that twenty hour weeks, but I still really wanted to play a sport. I still wanted to, you know, keep learning and doing that. So England was a perfect opportunity for me to keep playing my sport and not have to give that full commitment. I I didn't I didn't coach in a performance program. So I so there's a difference between the sort of athletes that are going to Essex uh, Durham, Umbria, I and mean, Alex. At some point, maybe you can list off the schools that are currently performance schools. Um, at Exeter, we didn't we didn't have volleyball is that uh, performance. Uh, a couple of other sports, I think rugby was. Uh, I don't remember who else might have fit into that category. But for me, I did have I mean, half of my team was born, and by that I mean not from England. <laughs> at least half. Sometimes it was more than that, depending on the team. I had Americans, um, and they were they were post grads. They were not former Division One players, but they were coming over to do school and they were they were coming to play volleyball. The commitment for us was a little bit different. Um, when you get below the top division, when you get below uh, the Premier League, the scheduling can be a little bit more dynamic, shall we say? Um, depending on what the schools are willing to negotiate with each other, we tended not to play on Wednesdays. At that time, uh, Bournemouth and Bath were the only two in our in our league in the West that forced us to play on Wednesdays. Everybody else negotiated playing on weekends. Uh, so that worked out where you did more tournament style, than, you know, try matches and, and things like that than playing, you know, the, the single match. That is what the schedule is, is drawn up to look like, but isn't what it happens in reality. And that, and that goes all the way down the ranks, uh, from what I've seen. And actually, when you start getting into, like, the second division, I don't think they only play a single round, Robin. I don't think they even play a double. So you might only have two or three days of actual competition. Uh, you're training once or twice a week, so it's not a big training load. Uh, a lot of times, though, the players will play. They may not play National League, but they might, might play in there. In Exeter, we had a, a City League, um, and we also had a Regional League in the Southwest. So um, in our club, we had over, like Alex said at the beginning, volleyball, you know, volleyball, like all the other sports, is club-based. The yeah. Exeter Volleyball Club had over 100 people, members. Um, and it was kind of broken up into beginners, intermediates, which was the biggest group, and then the Bucks teams. So the Bucks teams were obviously playing, you know, representing the school competitively. The intermediates played in the City League, in the Exeter City League. The Bucks players also played in the Regional League to get the extra competition, um, which I used as a coach developmentally to give everybody playing time. And and we just took, you know, a lot of times we'd only play seven players, eight players for that, and just rotated around who was going to go. Um, so there's there's a, a variety of experiences that you can have, um, and you've got it at, at, at Essex too because the club isn't really part of performance. They're not really related, right, Alex? Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. So um, some years the first team, like the performance team, and the second team are very close, uh, and other years they're they're really not. Uh, it just depends on the makeup of the students each year. Some of them will be like, hey, let's let's hang out and uh, and socialize with each other. Um, other years, they, they keep to themselves. Um, but what we have now is that our second teams train before us on a Tuesday and a Friday night. So there is a little bit of a, an overlap there. Uh, and then also, um, for the last three years, I think it is, uh, the second team coaches have actually been first team players. So they've been uh, a way for them to um, feel part of one club, shall we say. Um, but it, it's within a performance program, we do a lot of the 
the logistics for the first team so they don't have to worry about how they're going to get to an away game if the time that we have to stay over they don't have to worry about booking that they don't have to worry about any entry fees or ordering any kit or jerseys whatever that's all taken care of whereas in the second team that's all done by the students for themselves um, which obviously has its pros and cons shall we say um, sometimes they're not very organized and they have to go through that process to learn to be organized and other years you get people turn up who are like on it from day one uh, and things run very smoothly um, but the the second team um, for us this year the the numbers of people that we're recruiting uh, so last year we had four of my performance athletes that played on the second team for most of the year um, and on the guys side this year it's probably looking like there's going to be 10 guys so our roster size will increase um, for those of you who don't know it, outside of the US you are only allowed 12 on a match day roster so there's no point traveling with more than 12 because you can only put those 12 names on the on the score sheet um, where this year we ran with 17 guys and 14 girls so uh, the girls st stuck together we didn't send anyone down to the second team but the, the guys yeah four of them were regular features in the second team because the reality was is they weren't going to get much court time with the firsts um, but they were clearly better than the, the second team so this year there was a less of a disconnect uh, and next year it's going to be interesting to see how it works if everyone turns up who says they're going to turn up that's a good problem to have mm -hmm. okay um, can could in theory American undergraduates come play in England yep. Yeah, so with, to my knowledge, um, now Essex is, has got one of the most, um, was the highest percentage of international students uh, within the UK. So we have, it's like 40% of our students are not British. Um, uh, and it's of that, it's approximately 50-50 from the EU and from uh, outside the, the EU. Uh, we have a lot of Greeks, a lot of Cypriots, uh, there's over 400 Norwegians and uh, but the Americans is actually one of our smallest populations on campus. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we had an, a, um, a dual nationality. She, her mother was British, but her father was American. She grew up in America, but she came to Essex to study her, her undergrad. Uh, so it is 100% possible. Um, it just doesn't happen very often. Um, we have more American postgrads than we do undergrads. Uh, but again, our, our education system is is different. It's it's apples and oranges, but they're both fruit. Uh, I seem to use that uh, description all the time now. Um, I mean, even if you look at our education, it's three years, not four years. So you don't have to do those other uh, random units that you have to do in the States, like the compulsory ones, like the American history, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, whereas if you're doing computer science, just study computer science uh, you don't have those those extras and so ours are three years um, and uh, and postgraduate wise 99% uh, of our masters are one year uh, rather than, than two years like they are in the States um, right. but yeah so you can uh, have Americans study uh, for an undergraduate for their, for their bachelor's degree um, depending on where you're from um, as in are you in state, out of state? Uh, the costs can work out significantly cheaper, or they can work out the same as what they are in America. Okay, uh, and of course we got to talk scholarships. Um, I know those are all over the place, uh, depending on the school, uh, depending on how good you are. <laughs> Just like it could be in, say, a Division Two program or a men's program, where you don't have you know, 12 full scholarships available. Uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so every university is different with what they offer, uh, and every university will ask different things from those scholarship athletes. Uh, so I know of a, a university that uh, currently doesn't have its own venue, yet they're able to offer a full tuition fee waiver for an undergraduate, um, which blows my mind but that's because they want to build something for the future um, 
where they, in America, full rides exist. In the UK, they don't exist. Not definitely not in volleyball. Uh, the closest you can get to a, um, a full ride would be um, where you have uh, um, full tuition fee waiver. That would be the closest that you could have. And um, yeah, if, depending again where you come from, whether you're from the EU or whether you're from, uh, from non-EU, depends on how much that that uh, that scholarship um, costs. Um, or how much that fee waiver can be um, can save you. Um, at Essex, we the way we're structured is that we have an undergraduate uh, budget and we have a postgraduate budget. So uh, they're they're split across the uh, the two different types of degree. Um, our undergraduates we offer a, a cash scholarship. Um, of up to two and a half thousand pounds depending on the standard the, uh, the level of the, the athlete whereas uh, yeah ourselves and I think it's one other university that I, that I know of can offer full tuition fee waivers for the right type of athlete um, historically at Essex those have been players that have played uh, at the elite elite level so last year we had Mark Plotcher who was a London 2012 Olympian and what 12 13 year pro he was on a, a full tuition fee waiver um one of p's uh former teammates uh colleen uh she'd play pro in uh, the czech republic after graduating uh, and then she came to, to essex and we had two guys that won the nc uh, a with lola like the back-to-back um squad the two guys from there they both had uh, full tuition fee waivers Whereas actually last year, um, I, I think on the men's squad, most people had between a third and 50% off of their tuition, I think it was. Um, and then on the girls' side, I think it was fairly similar. I think we had one that was a little bit more than the rest, uh, a girl that had played for Serbia on the beach. Um, but... Yeah, so it, scholarships as a full ride don't exist, but tuition fee waivers or tuition fee reductions do exist. Um, and most universities will offer some form of sports scholarship, but the requirements are just completely different depending on what the university wants. Some will make you do loads, and some will make you sign a piece of paper, stand in front of a photo, and talk about the university in a positive manner. They're all different so I would just recommend doing some research as to what the university offers and what their expectations are okay so P and Logan this is probably a better I'm reading off some questions that get submitted in advance um, we've you guys have kind of already touched us on this a little bit but can you talk about um, what the support is like in terms of athletic training strength and conditioning and academic services Mm. I, I'm scared to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we had two trainer, I guess they were trainers, athletic trainers, um, that gave us like a, a weight program as well as like an agility program that we would do. And that would be, I think, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I honestly don't know. Not on Wednesdays because we had games. I don't remember. <laughs> but it was that kind of structure. And then we also, as a team and as a program, harped on going in on your own and kind of, you know, taking care of your, your body on your own and getting an extra lifts. Um, a lot of us had goals where, for me, I, when I had finished my senior year of undergrad in December, I thought I was done playing volleyball. And then the day after graduation, Colleen, who had been at Essex the year before, was like, hey, I um, want to tell you about this program that I just did. Uh, they're looking for a setter. I think you'd be good. And I was like, Sure. And so I had to get completely back into volleyball shape um, by the time I got there. And I was like, I need help. <laughs> and um, the trainers over there just did a good job of, you know, coming up with something for me. Um, and then there were a couple other girls on my team who thought that their, you know, physique and everything was just as important as everything else. So we definitely did a bunch of other lifts together. Um, Again, they, there was a team structure, but it was a lot of just holding each other accountable, which I think was nice because 
it kind of gave us a little bit more power than I guess having you know Alex or having someone else um, I guess chirping in our ear which there were points points of the year where we had to kick everyone back into gear because people were getting a little lazy on us but that's how it is in every program I think so um, definitely had some wake-up calls but on that end it was really nice um, as far as injuries I was blessed where I didn't have to deal with that much and I think our team was pretty blessed as well we didn't have too many injuries but um, yeah I'm not completely sure what the plan of attack on that end was the guys team had some injuries I think. yeah they they rehabbed with uh, the athletic trainer there I was going to touch about uh, the academic support too um, I actually changed my master's after I got there and I worked with the uh, business school support staff and they made sure that uh, Uh, transition was seamless. There's definitely there that uh, will help you make sure academic goals as well as your athletic goals. Yeah. So I did the same thing. I ended up changing my um, major whenever we got there. We actually ended up doing the same program, which was nice. But also the the like teacher to classroom ratio is pretty small. So you're able to really talk to your professors and get into the details of things if you need to. So they're pretty open on that end, which is nice. Yep, there was. And, and I'm guessing it was probably a largely, you know, in the U.S. there's usually somebody in athletics who's an academic support, something or other, a counselor, a coordinator. Of course, your coaches are doing, making you do study hall, stuff like that. But that's not, that doesn't exist in England, correct? No, again, it's just you having to do everything on your own, which is nice, especially when you're a postgrad. You kind of have done the four years of having people on you all the time about every aspect of your life. So it's nice when you're just in England, you're on your own. You can come up with your own structure and figure it out in a way that works for you. And then, again, also because we had Bucks on Wednesdays, if we had an important class or an important test, Porter made it clear that if you guys need to stay for class, do it. Like, we'll figure out what to do on the court. You figure out what you need to do in the classroom. So it was just nice that there was a better balance of importance, I guess, on, on what you wanted to do for yourself and what you think would make you more successful. So I'm a, a very strong believer in that um, you should be a student athlete, not an athlete student. Uh, and for people that have competed in the NCAA, they may question which way around those words go. Um, but I, I'm a very strong believer in being a student athlete, so much so that we've had, uh, mm -hmm. like, for example, when we went and played against Exeter, uh, this year I think we took eight players or seven players. Uh, Logan, did we take seven with you as well? Maybe even six. Uh, I think we only had six. I think yeah. Ali played all the way around. Yeah, he did, he did. So... You know, this year we had 17 and we took seven or eight. Last year we had 14, I think it was, in the squad, and we took six. Because people had class. Like, that's important. And, and I think we're the only ones in the country that monitor attendance uh, as well as uh, the coursework results. So we ask our students to be better than the average student so we know what their, their grades are. Um, and when they go to class, they have to tap in. Um, at the beginning or at the end of a, of a class so we know if they're going uh, or not uh, because it's important because what happens if uh, you walk out of the classroom you roll your ankle and your volleyball career is done but you need to have that, that backup plan and so education is, is very important okay uh, quick question in terms of what happens after they get done with you because somebody wants to know you know, what's, what's the, what are the opportunities to then go progress on and play, say, professionally in Europe or something along those lines? So we've been running six years, and I think we now have 12 of our athletes that have gone on to play professionally uh, at various different different levels. Um, so that is a, it is a possibility, but um, it's also uh, getting you in the right place at the right time. Uh, we've had a, a couple of people that have gone to, to Europe and then have played for three or four years. We've had others that have gone for one year uh, and others that have wanted to go and then that, nothing, has, nothing has come up. It's just a, a bad year, no opportunities. Um, 
And you know what, what's going to happen next year with coronavirus? No one knows. No one knows. So, yes, it is possible. Um, we record all of our games, and so the students have access to that. Um, I would say that most of the Americans have access to their their games from back home as well, so they'll probably put a, a highlights reel of between the two of them, probably more from the American League, because the standard is higher. I, I'm never going to say that our league is, is better, because it, it's, it's not. I, we've definitely improved in the last 10 years. Um, but when a European coach sees UC Irvine versus Long Beach, like they know who those two, two teams are and they know the, the level of, of play. So, yeah, it is possible. We've had, uh, I think it's two people from Essex who have uh, completed their Masters or uh, their MBA and stayed um, and have worked in, in London. Uh, that. That doesn't happen very often, but, but our visa system has changed in the last couple of years. So our current students, they actually have um, a visa extension of two years after they graduate uh, and they can work in any job um, in those two years, which is amazing because that's one of the barriers to getting a job if you want to stay is who's paying for that visa, who's the, who's the sponsor for it. Um, but now, two years, like... You could be working in McDonald's or you could be working for Goldman Sachs. Yeah. It gives you a chance to get a job, get a place to stay, and then find the, the real job that you want to do. All right, let's talk about recruiting. What's That's the fun. process for, for somebody coming to play in England? So the earliest I've ever signed someone uh, is 53 weeks before we started. So, uh, and the, the latest I've ever signed someone is probably middle of August for a middle of September start. Uh, that's stressful. Um, the longer time period is, it makes life a lot easier. So I use four different agents uh, as well as my network of former students that will uh, recommend people. Um, so I use Team Gleese, uh, Tiebreak, uh, which is run by a former one of our one of our former players, um, Bring It, um, and then uh, what's the other one? Play Overseas. So the four agencies that that we use, uh, they will send students through to me with a highlight video, maybe a whole match video uh, throughout the year, uh, and then. Um, we will, if they're of the right kind of playing standard, uh, the process for, for Essex is that I will um, interview them on Skype and tell them about the university and about the volleyball program. Uh, then they'll we'll have a follow-up um, Skype where they do all the talking and they I find out about them. I find out about their personality and go through a questionnaire with them. Um, and they, they have to apply and get onto the master's program. Uh, after that, I'll get to a certain point of the season, which is like now, which is where I've gone from, I think this year I've had over 40 applicants and I'm down to 17. And over the next week, I will go down to probably about eight. Um, and I'll make uh, this year, I'm probably going to have six or seven um, postgrads across the both men's and women's squads. Uh, and I will make them an offer. Obviously, I'll get references. I will send them a medical questionnaire as well, so I know about people's um, injuries uh, before they come in. Uh, and then I'll add them all to a massive Facebook group um, so they can ask all those questions because they do ask questions every year. Um, we help them with their accommodation. We have a block on campus, so that takes away a big part of that uh, stressful um, part of the recruitment process. <laughs> so that all of our postgrads live together <clears throat> or they live in two flats above each other um, and yeah once you get to june that's when they can apply for their visa uh, and then uh, once they get that they can book their flights and hopefully turn up on time which for us again is mid-september but for other universities it might be a little bit earlier might be a little bit later p and logan i'll, I'll, I'll get your perspective in one sec but two technical questions. First, uh, do you have any influence on whether somebody gets admitted? And second, uh, what was the second? 
<laughs> oh, there aren't any rules in recruiting, are there? This, this isn't the NCAA. There aren't any contact at this point, no contact at that point, how many times, all that other stuff. I can question two. I can do what I want. When I want, how I want. There's no restrictions whatsoever. Some people I will spend 15, 16, 17 hours um, helping to recruit them to university. <coughs> other people it might just be like three or four because you can tell instantly with some people, are they the right type of person? And at Essex, that's something that's really important to me. I, uh, no dickheads. Like having a dickhead on the team can really make life difficult. Having two of them on a team can kill it uh, for, that, for that year group. So um, spending time on, the, on FaceTime or whatever, WhatsApp, um, you get to know these athletes. And some people you know, you know within five minutes, I like this person. This person and me, we're going to get on as long as they have other things like Pete and Logan. Like, as long as their volleyball stuff checks out, I pretty much know within five minutes I was going to sign P. Like it just, you get that vibe from some people. Um, and sorry, what was the first question? Oh, first question about do I have any influence uh, on the influence, admission decision? Influence. <clears throat> um, I'm going to say no. Have you any? Well, let's put it this way: Have you ever had anybody who's applied that didn't get in? One person. Okay. So it's not a big risk, we'll put it that way. I couldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this is where being a good person helps. So uh, what I would do is, uh, as, for example, I don't think I've done it with P, but I would get off of the phone with, uh, with P after the second phone call and I would be calling up the, was it biological science? Was that the first one that you've done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would have phoned up the head of that course and said, hey, this is me. Um, because our program, I'm going to say, is still fairly new, it's six years. I didn't know everyone in the university, whereas now I'm, I'm fairly well known within most departments. And I will phone them up and say, hey, I've got this student that would love to talk to you uh, about the course. Uh, they're really interested. This is their GPA. Um, and the thing is, is when you become a person rather than a number, life is significantly easier. Because lecturers don't want to have idiots on okay. their program. Either. So, you don't, so you, don't have, you don't have you don't have you don't have official influence. Yeah, yeah, you don't have official influence. But <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> all right, all right. It, it's, it's beneficial <laughs> when you introduce people. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right, P. What was the what was the recruiting experience for you? I'm sure it was considerably less stressful than when you yeah. went to Den. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, uh, I kind of touched on it, but I thought I was done with volleyball and with school. <laughs> um, so my season ended in December. We lost in the first round. Sad, it's fine. Um, and then I was done with volleyball, and I was like, wow, I'm a normal student again. Like, let's see what this is like. So I enjoyed my last semester in college. And then the day after graduation, Colleen texted me. Um, she had was just finishing up her season in her school year in England, and she told me a little bit about, about the program. And she was like, if you're interested, I, I'd love to connect you guys and, and you know see if it'd be a good fit. And at this point, I hadn't fully like decided what I was going to do as far as work um, after graduation. Um, I had like a, a trip planned with my family. Um, my parents are from Sri Lanka, so we planned a trip um, with my roommate to go to Sri Lanka, as well as we had another roommate in Australia, so we went there. Um, and at this point, I was emailing Alex, and he's like, yeah, let's set up a phone call, uh, set up a Skype interview. I was like, sure, why not? And at this point, I was in Australia, so it was like 2 a.m. my time, like 11.30 his time. Like, it was just like weird timing. But we're like, let's do it. And it, same thing within like the first five minutes or so. I was like, okay, I could definitely play with this guy. Like, he seems like a great coach. He was already um, a big portion of the volleyball program at Denver, kind of focused on the mental aspects of the game. Obviously, 
there is a huge physical aspect and you have to be a pretty good athlete to play volleyball, but especially in the women's game, there's a lot of mental toughness that I think comes into the game that um, is now being talked about here in the last few years. It wasn't really talked about when I was growing up, but um, Alex definitely talked about that with me. And I was like, love that. I'm here for it. I, I'm down to bring that aspect of my game over. Um, and then other than that, yeah, it was just a few, a few more calls. Um, he ended up calling my family, which I wasn't with because I was in Australia and they're in Sri Lanka. And so I was like, talk to them. Like, they're cool. They're nice. And so um, I pride myself on my family. I feel like we're all kind of the same weird group of people that are easy to talk to. <laughs> um, so they had a conversation and my parents were like, he seems great. This seems like a, a good opportunity. You might as well do it. I, before my senior season, had um, shoulder surgery. So I like mended everything and, and was ready to go by senior year so I don't fully feel like or at that point I didn't feel like I was done so I was like hey perfect opportunity get a year get my master's be able to travel which is like my true passion is just traveling which is why corona is the worst thing ever because I can't leave my house but it's fine um <laughs> and so yeah it was just some phone calls and um sending over transcripts and filling out the, the application form as usual and then he um, added me into the, the group, so it was a bunch of postgrads. Um, one of them, Millie Smith, she had done her undergrad at um, Essex as well, so she kind of just knew the lay of the land really well, and she was kind of our point person for all the questions we had, which we're all pretty lost coming in. But, yeah, we had a good group. I think it was me, um, uh, Amber, she went to Dayton, um, and then Kat, she had actually ended up playing beach with one of my, like, childhood teammates. So I was like, weird, small world, because she's from Serbia. So um, we were the three postgrads. Uh, and then the guys had, like, ten postgrads that were all American. But we had a nice group. We all lived together on campus um, in different flats, but they're all, like, across the hallway from each other. Um, so it was just, it was, it was a good setup. It was a good time. <laughs> what was it like being a postgrad surrounded by a bunch of undergrads? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's kind of the same thing as it is in NCAA when you're a freshman, you're like, oh my God, this is so cool and crazy. And then by your, your senior year, you're like, these freshmen are dumb. Like they do not know what's going on. Like <laughs> they just do not get it. Um, and so there are definitely, there's a learning curve, of course, when I went in um, and Alex graciously gave me and Amber kind of a platform to where we were able to just talk to the girls and be like, hey, on the mental side of things, when things are not going right, that does not give you the right to just stop talking to people and, you know, implode on yourself. And I was able to talk about, you know, the mental toughness side of the game. And I think by the end of the season, we had better lines of communication. We had girls that used to go up and swing on any sort of ball. They'd be like, wait, let me, let me be smart on this <laughs> and just do a roll shot. And then we'd re reset. I'm like, oh my God, wow. Like, it was just amazing to kind of see the curve of where we started to where we ended and seeing how different people kind of took in the different things that we had to bring um, with open arms. Um, of course, there was some pushback on being like, why can't I just do whatever I want? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that would work if it was working, but it's not, is it? <laughs> so we, uh, and it was nice. Like I, I just had kind of a s sense of authority where I felt like I could be honest with the girls and there wouldn't be any hard feelings or anything. So it was nice that um, he just kind of, you know, he was like, Hey, these girls have experiences. They played at the NCAA, like listen to what they have to say. And we were lucky enough to have a team full of girls that were willing to listen and, take on those things that we have to say. So it was good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, somebody asked a question about whether there are any such thing as, as official visits. Uh, I think we could probably gather that everything is done remotely. <laughs> uh, so I've and, had two, I've had two people visit from the States. Yeah. But you didn't pay so, for it, right? Nope. No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> That's what we would call unofficial visits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, we had uh, one person come last summer, so she's uh, currently studying her MBA, and she wanted to come over and meet the staff, uh, and she's got some friends that live here as well, so she uh, flew into London and then came to Essex for a day, um, took her around, introduced her to a few people, the course side as well, and then she was in London for whatever, four or five days, 
Uh, and another one, uh, we had an American who was traveling around Europe for four months, five months uh, with her sister. And she's like, hey, uh, I'm going to be in London next week. Can, can I swing by? Can I just come onto campus? I'm like, yeah, of course you can. So again, same thing, show around, introduce her to the SNC coach, some of the, the um, other performance sports staff. Um, I think it's having people on campus is a very powerful tool. It makes people feel less, um, less stressed uh, because they, they can pitch themselves there. And when they meet the staff, they're like, oh, that's just Justin. That's just Susie. Like it's, they're just another person rather than, oh, my God, I've just received an email from the performance board manager. Like, again, when you become a, a person rather than just an email or an applicant number, I think life gets a lot easier for people. So if people could do a visit, great, but that's not going to affect um, the scholarship offer and probably not going to affect um, the academic offer either. But I know for quite a few postgrad courses, they do a Skype interview anyway, just so you get to meet the staff. Yeah. And again, the school's not paying for it. Correct. There were also times where if there were girls that were like a senior in college that were thinking about coming, Porter would just give me their phone number and I would talk to them, just like I'm talking to you guys, where I'd just be like, this is what I did. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. You should try. <laughs> and yeah. Michaela did that and she ended up coming. So it was like yeah. just a good way to open up lines of communication. Yeah. Again, not allowed under NCAA rules. <laughs> yeah. no. uh, okay. Uh, Alex, I'm going to have you talk about which schools are the are currently the performance programs so people understand but just before that uh, if anybody has any questions feel free to shoot them in you can use the question and answer function and we'll try to get you some answers go for it Alex okay uh, so I would say there are seven performance programs just to recap, performance program probably train three four times a week have some type of uh, scholarship available and are playing at a okay level. Um, so those would be uh, Essex for both men and women. Um, I'll, go, I'll do the Southern Conference first and the Northern Conference. So Essex men and women, UEL, which is University of East London, uh, they offer uh, both men and women. Bournemouth, or just BU as they're called, uh, they do um, both men and women. Um, they are also located right next to the beach. So the Bucks Beach or the Bucks Sand event is uh, like the championships is held in, in Bournemouth. Um, that's something else we should probably talk about in a moment as well about Bucks Beach. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, that's the, the three performance programs in the Southern Premier League. But uh, in the Northern, you have um, Nottingham. So they started four years ago, I think it was, they had both men and women. Uh, Sheffield Hallam, uh, which is where I went as a, as a student, and that was the only program available back then. Uh, they only have men's programs still. Um, then you have Durham, who have men's and women's. Um, and then Northumbria, um, they had a very successful program for a number of years, and then they lost some funding and then got some funding back again. So um, I'm hoping that they go back to where they were before, where they have a, a full-time coach. Um, so they're the, the, the seven performance, but then there's also some newer, smaller programs that have a, a slightly different focus. So uh, for example, Warwick University, they now have a, a coach for 16 hours a week, but their, their focus at the university has been the most um, active university uh, in the UK so their focus is more on participation but as a byproduct of that they're training more than what they ever have done uh, and then you have Cambridge Anglia Ruskin so that's not Cambridge University to clarify that's Cambridge Anglia Ruskin or Cambridge ARU uh, they have a coach for 16 hours a week um, they're they're in the lower leagues so they're working their way up to uh, to hopefully get into the, the Premier and if both of those get to the Prem, they will be in the South. So that's five of the six teams that will be performance programs. Uh, and then you also have Derby as well. They're very similar to Cambridge Anglia Ruskin. They have a coach for, for 16 hours a week. 
um, and they're working their, their way up. So there's uh, 10 programs in total. Um, there's some other programs that pop up every now and again. I say a program, they, they'll have a strong team for a year, maybe two years, because they've got some scholarship money. So uh, Newcastle Women, a couple of years ago, they were, were really strong. Um, I, I didn't see them this year, so I couldn't comment on, on their level. Uh, this year um, and then historically there was um, Leeds University so Simon Loftus he was the head coach there took them from Division 3 to the Super League champions in the National League and Division 3 and Bucks to Bucks Premier League champions as well um, so he done a fantastic job up there unfortunately the university um, stopped supporting performance sport for every sport so they um, they stopped offering uh, volleyball uh, scholarships the same way they did before and then Bath they were a similar kind of situation they uh, invested a lot of money and, and then they changed their minds um, Loughborough so, so again sorry Lough, same with Loughborough yeah Loughborough used to be the women's national team program so when I was at Sheffield Hallam Loughborough was the, the women's and they had like three teams in the national league like it used to be you could only have one team in each division and they would like win the Super League, Division 1, Division 2. Like they were, they were really good. Uh, but volleyball has uh, become a less important sport at, uh, at Loughborough. Uh, they're still doing all right, but they're, they're nowhere near where they used to be. Yeah, when I was coaching Exeter, the first year was the tail end of that. So I got to Exeter in 2012 and they still had some leftovers a bit from the program that it led into to the London games. Um, but then, and because we had to play them in the first round of championships, and then they disappeared. Yeah. They were not a factor after that, which was kind of sad. Yeah. So, but the, go back 10 years, and there was just one program. And then Northumbria popped up. <coughs> Sorry, Leeds popped up. And then Northumbria. <coughs> My personal opinion is that the future of, uh, of volleyball in England is universities. They're the, the ones that have got their own venues, they have their own vehicles, they have staff, they have a workforce. Um, so I can see us taking more of a NCAA route rather than the European route, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? You want to touch on beach? Yeah, so um, obviously you have uh, the sand uh, leagues in in america we don't have that in the university structure so we have bucks beach which is just one weekend uh, a championship that's held in bournemouth and there's three levels of play that are all take place on that weekend uh it's the championship the trophy and i don't know what the third one is called actually it's called the conference i don't know yeah. um and so the three yeah three levels and you can enter uh one team into the championship i think it's two or three teams into the trophy and then i'm not going to say an unlimited amount in the conference but you you can enter more into the bottom ones it depends on the how many universities enter that year uh -huh. and that's worth an equivalent number of points for uh for volleyball so uh, we're in a lucky situation where, for example, you win the, the, the Bucks Premier League South, you get 50 points for your university, you win the playoffs, you win the championship, you get another 50, and then you go to Bucks Beach and you win the championship, you get another 50. So there's a lot of points on offer, which is why um, universities are looking at volleyball and going, hmm, we can get more, more Bucks points here. Um, the way that we do Bucks Beach at Essex, uh, what would have happened this year, so we had uh, Chris Gregory, who's uh, played on the World Tour. Um, he was one of our students, and so he was going to be running uh, some uh, sessions before Bucks Beach for the month before. Uh, and then we were going to go and, uh, and play in the tournament. Um, I'm not, I don't profess to be a, a beach coach, uh, so I learn every year from the students that I have. Um, yeah, I drive the guys down there uh, in the bus. I sit and offer my minimal experience on beach, on, on beach um, and, and try to learn as things goes along. And so, yeah, for people out there, Bucks Point, 
I, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think in the States, there's, there's an equivalent that Stanford seems to always win. I don't know if it's called the commissioner's cup or something like that, but it's based on the number of national championships and all that sort of stuff that the different schools get. Conceptually, it's a similar idea across all the sports. And yeah, some so schools take league. it a lot more seriously than others. Yeah, there's a Bucks League league table, which is an accumulation of every single um, every single sport. And I don't remember when it started, but let's say it's been going 30 years. It's been, it's longer than that. And Loughborough University have won that Bucks Championships every year for 30 years. No one has ever knocked them off the top. But the Durham University was the number one university for team sports. So they won more team events than anything. But when you throw in swimming and athletics, you know, Loughborough just crush everyone. Um, although this year, uh, I think it was Nottingham, was g- getting very, very close to being able to beat Loughborough. But then coronavirus has happened, so we will never know if they were able to take their crown for the first ever time. All right. Okay, I don't have any more questions. I mean, somebody did ask about a player who wants to go to medical school. I don't, you guys don't have a medical school at Essex, do you? We do, but we don't. So, uh, and this will be very similar for other universities in the UK. Uh, a lot of medical courses are run by the NHS or in partnership with the NHS. So um, it means that the funding will come from the NHS. So they, if you're non-EU, then you would have to fund it yourself. Um, and there's a limited number of places on those courses. And from my experience, when you are on that type of course, you are on placement a lot. So I've got a, a friend who is doing a, a physio um, master's course, paid for, organized by the NHS. And he every six weeks, he's out on placement. So he can't. He's not a volleyball player, but he wouldn't be able to uh, be a full-time member of our squad because he's away for half the year. Right. And it's more of a nine-to-five course. Mm-hmm. Whereas P, how many hours was your course in in the classroom? Like two. <laughs> <laughs> two a day, <laughs> if that. So no, ser- seriously, the life of a master's student is pretty yeah. pretty easy nice. and then classes ended around the same time yeah. that volleyball had ended so then the rest was just like writing our papers and getting um our advisors um to help us out but then other than that you could do whatever so it was nice <laughs> yeah well how did see i don't know about this as a grad student um my question you know from your perspective obviously you're used to the u.s structure where Okay, you, you go through the fall, you've got exams in December, boom, semester's over. Mm-hmm. Start the new se- semester sometime in January, go through Mar- through probably May, you get done, somewhere around there. Whereas in England, you start September, October, you stop in December, you haven't done your exams yet, you have a break, you mm-hmm. come back for a week and do exams, and then you roll right into the next term. Mm-hmm. And then you stop at the end of March and you've got like a whole month off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you have like Easter break. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Easter break. And then you've got finals like the whole month of May. Although yeah. with master's students, you've got thesis and stuff like that. So that kind of rolls into the summer. But. In my program, we didn't have any exams. It was all papers, which was nice because um, then you could just do advising via email. Um, but what I, what I ended up doing was I worked on campus as um, I just did like packaging for the student marketing team. So I was like sending like prospective packages and um, like acceptance packages uh, to students across the world, actually. Um, so I did that, and then I would do like weekend trips to like Barcelona and to Rome, <laughs> all these magical places that are really hard to get to from the states, but are really easy to get to in London. So, so just yeah. on that, just on that. So this year, like, so I issue a calendar at the beginning of every year. Uh, which for most of the time we, we don't add things in, we take things out as the season progresses. And um, this year in November, um, there was a free weekend. Uh, and I think on the Wednesday, I don't think we had a game in Bucks either. And for me, I always say, ask. Like, I'm, ne- I'm never going to just be point blank no, but, you know, if you ask three, four weeks in advance, I'm probably going to say yes. And I had one of my um, male athletes ask me, hey, coach, um, 
that weekend that's free, um, I want to go to Rome. If I fly f- uh, Saturday morning, it's like a hundred pounds. Uh, if I fly like Friday morning, it's like thirty pounds. If I fly Thursday night, it's ten pounds. Like, okay. <laughs> Can, can I miss training Friday night? Because Thursdays is a night off, so that didn't make, matter anyway. It's like, can I miss Friday night training? And I'm like, okay, go. Like, that's fine. And it's like, what about Friday morning? Can I can I miss the S&C session on a Friday morning? I'm like, can you do the, the S&C session Thursday night? Yeah. Then go. He's like, amazing. This was the Monday. By Thursday, 16 of my athletes are now going to Rome for the weekend. So, and then after that, I had a couple go to Scotland, someone go to Sweden, someone go to Estonia, and there was like three people left. So I was like, there is no training Friday night, and I went on a date with my wife, which was amazing. Like, you know, in season, there's no time for date night for me. Um, but yeah so it, it was a, a kind of a win-win situation and suppliers get a chance to, to travel um during the season we had uh, some guys and girls booked to go to uh, ireland for the weekend around st patrick's days we had a couple of girls go off to morocco uh for a few days as well this year so there, there is definitely an opportunity to travel and we're very blessed at essex because we've got uh, harwich port just down the road which takes you to holland on the boat uh, and then you have South End and EasyJet, which so South End and Stansted, which Ryanair and EasyJet both fly from, and you know, flights are. Pfft, yeah, they really pounds. are less than fifty bucks, and you're like, hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, less than fifty bucks, and you can go to Rome or go to Barcelona or yeah. Morocco. Like it's it's insane. Sometimes the the bus to the airport costs more than the flight to Europe. Mm-hmm. So we're very lucky uh, in that regard. Yeah. But um, I always say Essex, it's volleyball, education, and experience. Those are the three pillars. Um, and they're the three things that I always go back to. When people ask me questions about, can I do this, can I do that? I'm like, well, volleyball-related, education-related experience, go do it. Tick those yeah. boxes because you're never going to get a chance in your life to, to do this again, to live in a foreign country and have the opportunity to go traveling around Europe. Uh, right. Once you get yeah. married and get a career. Okay. Wow. I did my PhD over there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we've covered everything. Uh, P, any final thoughts, comments, whatever? Advice to anybody looking at the idea of going to do a postgrad in England or the UK more generally? I say do it. <laughs> That's what I kind of thought. Do it because honestly, it's only a year like you're not going to have a program like that in America um and again kind of what we just been talking about for the past five minutes it's just so easy to go and gain all these experiences um and then you get to meet people from all around the world as well as people that you know might have played with one of your childhood teammates like it's just the volleyball world is so small and I think um we just don't take advantage of it as much as we could so do it take the plunge. Alex, anything final from you? It's just that you don't have to be, um, there are scholarships out there which are not related to volleyball. Uh, Most universities you you can't stack, some you can, but like for example at Essex, if your GPA is above a 3.25 and you're an American, you get instantly 2,000 pound discount off of your tuition. And our tuition for our masters for Americans is 17,000, I think it is, 18,000 maybe. But the most expensive is 20, and that's the MBA. Everyone else is, uh, all the rest of our courses are are cheaper than that. So for one year plus your your accommodation, like it, it does work out uh, cheaper. And, and at other universities, they will do similar things. They will offer an academic excellence or they'll offer an America's scholarship um every university will have a scholarship page on their website so go on there and you might get one like most universities have a santander uh, scholarship which i think is four or five thousand pounds um and they have a handful of those each and uh, you, know, you get that's almost a third off of your tuition and that's not related to sport so uh, it, do some research go go online to the university pages find the 
uh, the course that you want to do and some uh, schools so when I say school like at Essex at the university we have like the business school the uh, the sports science school the um, psychology school and each of those schools they have their own scholarship budgets as well so um, yeah the headline price uh, will be X but they will have their own um, scholarship so research is is crucial really crucial studentships are available mm -hmm. in a lot of places all right thank you both thank it's you pleasure fun and informative <laughs> all right we'll see you around cool. hey. Cheers, see ya